Good morning. Welcome back to 8th Grade World History. I'm Mrs. Birch and we are going to continue today with our study of the Middle Ages, of medieval times. Last week we talked about the Black Death and we went over some things that that would do to a civilization if something like that were to happen. Today we're going to talk about war. Several different wars are going to occur. Now we're going to talk about the High Middle Ages and the Latter Middle Ages. So what you're going to see today is you're going to, we're going to talk about the Crusades, the Magna Carta, which was a document that's going to be very important to the history of our country, Joan of Arc, the Wars of the Roses, the Italian Renaissance is something we're going to uh, mention briefly and then we're going to really get into that next week. But without further ado, let's start today's lesson. Today we're going to start with the Crusades. So today the Crusades, we're going to talk about how they started and why they started. First of all, let's preface it with, remember I told you earlier that, the part, that Europe was primarily a Christian country. Everybody in Europe, for the most part, was dedicated to the Catholic Church. Well, that was very powerful force in the Middle Ages. But what's going to happen is in the Middle East, a group of people called the Muslims, primarily the Seljuk Turks, are going to take over a very important piece of land called the Holy Land. Well, that is going to anger the people of the Catholic Church because they are going to want the Holy Land, which is a symbolic thing for the Christian church. They want to be in charge of that. And you've got another religion coming in and taking over that piece of land. Well, they were not very happy about that. But what is going to really spark the Crusades is going to be when a group of people that lived in the Byzantine Empire are going to say, the Seljuk Turks have taken over the Holy Land, but they're also threatening us, and we need your help. So even though they were not Catholic Christians, they were Orthodox Christians, they decided that they needed help from the Catholic, a very powerful Catholic Church in Europe. And so the emperor of the Byzantine Empire called on Pope Urban II and said, you have to help us because if you don't, we're going to fall to the Seljuk Turks as well. So the premise of the Crusades is a holy war over the Holy Land. Well, that might bring a question to you. Whose holy land is it anyway? Because if you look at modern times, we're still fighting over whose holy land is it. So I want to briefly touch on that for a moment. So the holy land is um, the territory from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. It's also referred to as Palestine. You've probably heard that term in modern day. First of all, the first group of people that lay claim to this holy land are the Jewish people. For the Jewish people, this piece of land represents their history. It is where King David brought the Ark of the Covenant. It is where King Solomon built the temple. It's where the Wailing Wall or the Great Wall that the Jewish people take pilgrimage and visit. That is a pilgrimage for them. They, the holy land they claim is theirs. The second group of people that have claim to the Holy Land are, of course, the Christians. The Christians, this is where Jesus was, this is where he preached, this is where he lived, this is where he performed his miracles, this is where he was crucified, this is where his tomb is, this is where he rose from the dead. So the Christian people claim that this piece of land, the Holy Land, is theirs. And then the last group of people that lay claim to the Holy Land are the Muslims. The Muslims say this is where Muhammad's night journey and his great ascension to God, to Allah, this is where that happens. So the Muslims also lay claim to the Holy Land. So this piece of land is going to cause trouble not only today, but it started way back then. And it started primarily with the Crusades. When the Muslims went in and took the Holy Land from the Christians and didn't allow the Christians to peacefully come and take pilgrimage to the Holy Land where Jesus was born, the Catholic Church takes a lot of issues with that. So we're going to start something called the Crusades. The pilgrimage to the crusade, a pilgrimage to these places means you go to visit them in order to honor your religion. The Jews do it, the Christians do it, and the Muslims do it. So the setting is ripe for war. You've got this religious fervor, but you've also got a land, remember, where life is very hard. People are not happy with their life. The peasants and the serfs are working very hard. The knights are working hard, and people you know, are, are very, uh, there's a lot of unrest that has to go with this particular time period. 
And also, the Seljuk Turks have taken over the Holy Land. So a lot of things are causing this, this ripeness for war. And then the Turks are threatening to attack the Byzantine Empire. So all of these factors are going to come into play, and we're going to have the great setting for a war. So the Byzantine Emperor is going to ask the Catholic Church for help. That is going to be the catalyst that's going to start this whole battle. So Pope Urban II is going to call the council at Clermont, and he is going to ask people from all over Europe to take up arms and to join in the fight against the Muslim occupation of the Holy Land, to protect the Holy Land of the Catholic Church. So Pope Urban's plea is going to be met with tremendous response because remember I just told you that the people are, there's a lot of unrest going on and people want a cause. They want something to fight for. So that's what's going to happen at this point. The purpose of the Crusades is to stop the spread of the Islamic faith, to retake control of the Holy Land, to conquer pagan areas and recapture formerly Christian territories, and to get the kings and the nobles to stop fighting each other and fight for a common cause. So all of those factors are taken before the council at Claremont, and they vote unanimously to take up the Crusades. So why did the people themselves, though, choose to fight? You might ask yourself, if you're just a common person, what are some reasons that you might want to fight? Some of the interesting reasons are, one, the church pretty much promised you, if you come and fight for us, you will get redemption for your sins. It was almost as if the church was selling you a ticket to heaven. If you're willing to come fight, take up this battle in the name of God and in the name of, church, in the name of the church, then you're going to go to heaven. So a lot of people did it to get redemption for their sins. Some people did it as a chance to get rich. Okay, we're going to leave Europe and we're going to go all the way to the Holy Land. Surely somewhere along that path I can find some gold and some riches for myself. And then last but not least, some people just did it for adventure. Something to, to liven up this life that they had, this dull, boring, hard life that they had. So you've got these people that are going to gladly take up arms in order to fight in the Crusades. So the first crusade, thousands of crusaders are going to come to France in order to organize to make the long journey to the Holy Land, to the Middle East. And they are going to come and they're going to sew these red crosses where you see the banner on my coat of arms. They're going to put on red crosses and they're going to have the rallying cry, God wills it, God wills it, and they're going to go fight in the name of God. That seems a little ironic to me. If you study any of these three religions that are involved, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, none of those religions necessarily call for violence. And I truly don't believe that that's what Jesus would have intended. But the church, the Catholic church, the most powerful entity at this time, says you have to go fight. And so they're going to start a war in the name of God. And they say God wills it. The sad thing is that the first victims of this first uh, journey into this battle, of uh, the first crusade, is not even going to be the Muslims. The Christians that take up arms at first are peasants and knights that have a passion for Christianity. A lot of them have a passion for Christianity. Well, they blame the Jewish people for the death of Jesus. That's still fresh in their mind. You know, they killed Jesus. And so along the way, on their path from France to the Middle East, they cross through an area near Germany. Well, in that area near Germany, they're going to come across about 700 Jewish citizens. And they are going to torture and murder violently these 700 Jews because they blame them for the death of Jesus. Again, they believe God wills it. They believe it's almost like a practice for them for when they're getting to the Muslims. And they're angry and they're, they're pent up with all of this energy. And they take it out on a group of innocent Jews. And so that's one of the other his times in history when the Jews are unjustly persecuted. The Jews are going to resist. But the resistance is, there's no need to resist. They are so far outnumbered. And many of the Jews even take the lives of their own children to keep them from being killed by these massive groups of people. 
Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is the, you know, we could talk about the Crusades all day long. There are eight of them. There's a lot of details that go along with them. But the point I want to make to you primarily about the Crusades is they really served no purpose when you come down and look at the history of the Crusades. There were eight of them. The first one, the Christians are going to win and they're going to run the Muslims out of the Holy Land. But if you look at the other crusades, the Muslims are going to win because it's going to go back and forth. And then the third crusades, again, the Muslims are going to still take over the Holy Land. The fourth crusade, oh, what an ironic thing the fourth crusade was. It wasn't even a primary battle between Muslims and Christians. It was a battle between the Catholic Christians and the Orthodox Christians. So now you've even got Christians fighting Christians in the name of God. That's very strange. And then the fifth crusade, you're going to have um, the, crew, the ally with the group of Muslims. And we're, again, the Muslims are going to still take control of the, the Holy Land. And then the sixth crusade, the Christians are going to win. And then the Muslims are going to win. And then finally, when the whole thing is over, the whole purpose for starting this, according to the Catholic Church, was so that the Muslims wouldn't have control of the Holy Land. Guess who ends up with control of the Holy Land in the end? The Muslims. So all of these years of war really didn't accomplish very much. So that's our first set of wars that were battles that we're going to talk about. Now, the Crusades were not the only problem that was going on in Europe. While the people were off fighting the Crusades in the Middle East, Europe still had a lot of things going on. And there was one particular king. His name was King John. And he was not fair to his citizens at all. He did not believe that the law applied to him. If he felt somebody was his enemy, he would order them to be killed. If he felt that something needed to be done, he would just make sure that it was done. The law did not mean anything to him. Well, the people, to make a long story short, were not happy with that. And so what they did is they wrote up a document. This document was called the Magna Carta. And they took him out into a field called Runnymede and they forced him to sign this document in front of a lot of very important, you know, dignitaries. And so he had to sign this document that said that under the Magna Carta, it placed all people and England's future sovereigns, their future kings, under the same set of rules. And it required the king to honor the rights of the people, that the people had rights that he had been denying them. And it also required everyone, even the king, to follow the same rules. Some of the rules that may seem uh, familiar to you are some rules that the Magna Carta brought to our country. And one of those is habeas corpus. In our country, you cannot be arrested and kept in prison unless someone tells you what your crime is. They have to actually charge you with a crime and you are entitled to a jury trial in, before you can be, the sentence can be carried out. Before the Magna Carta, the king could just say, I think you're guilty. He could charge you and not even tell you what you're charged with and have you beheaded. That was his power. Well, after the Magna Carta, there was a justice system. There was a balance in the justice system of Europe. Now, the Magna Carta was revised and improved several times over the years, and it actually did some great things. It limited the power of the king. It created a parliament. Now, parliament is a governing body made up of lots of different citizens who actually tell the king and give, you know, work with the king in order to make sure that the people are taken care of. No longer is it a singular king who can make all of the decisions. The parliament is still in existence today in Europe. And by the later Middle Ages, kings could do very little without the support of the parliament. And some of this may sound familiar to you because our government is going to be set up very similarly to that of what occurred in Europe after the Magna Carta was written. As a matter of fact, our founding fathers, when they came to the United States and they were setting up the colonies and they decided that they thought the king was treating them unfairly as colonists, they were being taxed inappropriately, they were not able to own their own land because the, the, the people of, of Britain, Great Britain were still telling them what to do. We decided to fight the War of Independence. And when we wrote, when our founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence and our Bill of Rights, they took the Magna Carta 
and they based a lot of what they wrote in the Declaration of Independence on the Magna Carta. As a matter of fact, if you go to Washington, if you go to the Declaration of Independence Hall, you will see a copy of the Magna Carta along with the Declaration of Independence. So political changes and unrest are going to continue in Europe. Another war that is going to occur is called the Hundred Years War. Now the irony behind that is it actually lasted a little bit longer than a hundred years. Now the reason that the Hundred Years War started is the King of France died and he did not leave a son in order to take over um, his reign. So there was a fight between two houses. There was the House of Plantagenet and the House of Valois. And they, took, they decided that each one of them had someone they wanted to be king. Well, to make a long story short, in this instance, the king of France from the House of Valois is going to be the one who is going to be named the king. Well, of course, that's not going to make the king from Europe very happy with what's going on. So the Plantagenets are going to actually start a war. And this war is going to last for many, many years. And again, you have the House of Valois, and we don't really have time today to go over all the people that are involved in that house, but you can go back and review this and maybe look at these slides a little closer. Now, again, we had this, the king died, no heirs, and two houses that are going to fight against each other. In the end, France is going to win this, this war, and France is going to become an independent state, no longer a part of Europe. They're going to become, and even today, France and Europe still don't like each other very much if you start studying their history because of what happened in the Hundred Years' War. A heroine is going to arise out of the Hundred Years' War. If you look at my second coat of arms here, this is a coat of arms for a lady named Joan of Arc. Now, Joan of Arc only lived to be 19 years old, but in those 19 years, lots of great things happened. Let's talk a little bit more about her in detail. First of all, let's talk about her childhood. She was born to a peasant family in France, and she had a pretty much a normal childhood, except for the fact that she was very religious, very pious. She took her religion very seriously, and everyone in her village knew that. At the age of 13, she started hearing voices. And during this particular time, let's see, she started hearing voices at the age of 13. It, she says, in my 13th year, when I heard a voice from God telling me to help me govern my conduct. So she thought these voices, the, the Archangel Michael, some of the great saints were telling her that God was instructing her to lead France to independence. Now, this is a 13-year-old girl, but for four years, she's hearing these voices. Finally, at the age of 17, she is going to go to the king and she is going to tell the king, give me permission and I will help you win this war. I will help you in the Hundred Years' War and we'll finally put an end to it and I will make sure that the rightful king of France is on the throne. And you know, the king's looking at her going, what, you're a little girl, what do you mean? Well, he finally believes her after consulting with the church and listening to some of these voices that she was hearing and things that she was saying. He agreed. So he is going to give this 17-year-old girl a set of armor and a horse and send her out at the battle at Orleans. Well, she's injured at that battle, but the French are victorious, and they dedicate that victory to the actions of Joan of Arc. Again, a girl not even supposed to be on the battlefield, but in full armor, and she's out there fighting for France, and she, France is actually going to win that battle. Well, Charles was crowned king of France on July 18, 1429, and guess who was by his side? Joan of Arc. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's the ending of a great story. No, not quite. The people of the English church, of the Catholic church, are not happy with the actions of this young girl. So they're going to accuse her of several things. They're going to accuse her of 70 counts of witchcraft, heresy, and believe it or not, dressing like a man. That was a terrible crime back then. So as of today, I would probably be in trouble if I lived back in the medieval times because I have on the clothing that a man would have traditionally worn. So during this time, she continued with her steadfast claim of innocence because she was very pious and very religious. And so no matter how much they questioned her, they threatened her, 
with all kinds of horrible things. They put her in a jail with a lot of um, males and she didn't have any protection in those jails. But she was eventually found guilty of heresy and burned at the stake. So that was a very sad ending to a very great life. But she was finally designated as a martyr and she was canonized, which means she was made into a saint by the Catholic Church. So today we know her as Saint Joan of Arc. By the way, if you go uh, to New Orleans, there's a statue of her in the French Quarter. It's a big golden statue. Now the last war I'm going to talk to you about has to do with this third coat of arms that I have up here. It's called the Wars of the Roses. Again, two great houses or family dynasties of rule are going to fight each other. One of them is the House of Lancaster, which is designated by the Red Rose. And the other is the House of York, which is designated by the White Rose. And both of these houses are going to fight each other for control of England. The War of the Roses is going to basically be these two great houses that are going to battle each other. And they're both from a great family called the Plantagenets. And remember, we mentioned them earlier. But these two factions of this great house are going to fight each other in the name of control. Well, to make this, this story uh, a little bit shorter than, than we have time for today, we can't tell the whole long story, but to make the story come to a conclusion, you're going to have a final battle. And this battle is going to be between King Henry and King Richard. King Richard is going to be killed, which is going to put an end to the rule of the York family and bring the Lancaster family to power. So the Lancaster family with King Henry is now in charge of the throne. And in order to bring the two together, he is going to marry Elizabeth of York. And that is going to put those two great houses, the Lancaster house and the York house, they're going to no longer be in existence. Now we're going to have the Tudor dynasty. And that dynasty is going to continue for many years. If you know anything about the monarchy of England today, you know that they have Queen Elizabeth. She's Queen Elizabeth II. So you might ask yourself, is she related at all to any of this stuff that was going on in England during this particular time? And the answer to that is yes. Queen Elizabeth is actually a direct descendant of Henry VII, who is the one that I just told you became the first Tudor king. So if you trace her lineage, you will see that she is related to both the House of York and the House of Lancaster. But she is actually from a royal house called the House of Windsor. So it does get a little bit complicated, but she is related to many of these ancient people that we've talked about today. Now, that's all we have for this week, but I just want to do a quick review of some of the things that we did talk about today. I want to first of all mention that the Black Plague that we discussed last week was going on during many of this. Many of these things that were occurring, the Black Plague was occurring at the same time in different places in Europe. So there's lots of stuff happening during this medieval period. You've got the Black Death going on. Then you've got the Crusades that are going to be happening and these people that are fighting in the name of God and trying to defeat the Muslims. Then you've got the Hundred Years' War, which has the French and the English fighting against each other, and that is going to take up a lot of time, and a lot of people are going to die in that effort. And then last but not least, you have the Wars of the Roses. So there's a lot of battle going on and a lot of fighting and a lot of war, and a lot of those things are going to definitely take and have an effect on modern-day history. So I hope that you take some of these topics, go back and look at them, do a little bit more research and figure out which ones interest you and see how they affect the world that we live in today. Now, we have one more week left. And boy, it's been you know, a great week, a great few weeks, and we've learned a lot. But I want you to definitely tune in next week because we are going to be talking about something that's really interesting, and that's the Italian Renaissance and Leonardo da Vinci and all of those great artists of this particular time period. And we're also going to be talking about the reformation of the Catholic Church. So I hope you're back with us again next week, and I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. I hope everyone has a good day. Stay safe and stay healthy.